thank you. So I, I uh, as a way of introducing uh, the speaker, then I want to say a few words. Uh, Roger got his PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara in 2005. He was uh, then a Wigner Fellow at Oak Ridge National Lab, not too far from here, from Chapel Hill. Uh, and, and, and soon after that, he joined the faculty at the University of Waterloo in 2007, where he is now. Uh, not physically now, but where he is now as uh, <laughs> as a professor. Uh, he uh, is also an affiliate of the Institute for Quantum Computing at that university and also an associate faculty at the Permitter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Uh, he has received multiple honors. I will just mention a few. Uh, the Early Researcher Award uh, from the Ontario Ministry of Research and Innovation, the Young Scientist Prize in Computational Physics from the International Union of Pure and Applied uh, Physics, and uh, he holds the Canada Research Chair in Computational Many Body Physics, Natural Sciences and Engineering. And he is a recipient of the Hertzberg Medal from the Canadian Association of Physics. Like I said, we're very happy to have you and, uh, 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 and we're very much looking forward to your talk. So without further ado, please take it away. Amazing. Thanks, Joaquin. Thanks uh, for the great introduction. And it's a, a pleasure to be here for Quantum Anybody Days. Um, I will, uh, I just like to point out, I think before I start, you know, all the amazing people that, um, you know, make this research possible, uh, both at the University of Waterloo and at Perimeter Institute's, what we call a quantum intelligence lab, which is a, a sort of, a, a loose, uh, affiliation of students and postdocs who, who are physicists typically working in condensed matter, uh, quantum information, but interested in machine learning. Uh, so I'll highlight a few names, I think, as I, uh, you know, as I talk uh, today. And I would also want to point out some of the collaborations uh, that we have with uh, sort of our friends at other institutes. Uh, most uh, predominantly, uh, Juan Carasquilla, pictured here, who is a faculty at Vector Institute. I'll talk about some of his work uh, with uh, post, uh, some of our postdocs and students. And also Giacomo Torlai, who's... Um, picture here eating pizza at the Flatiron Institute. Uh, so a lot of what we do um, in this work is in collaboration with these other institutes. So I'm going to talk about reconstructing quantum states with generative models. And um, as Joaquin mentioned, I'm a, I'm a computational condensed matter theorist, or at least that was uh, hopefully uh, obvious from the introduction. And so what I'm interested in is quantum many body simulation. Okay, let me know if it didn't uh, uh, progress to the next slide, but I think it did. So I'm using quantum simulation or you know, quantum simulation of many body systems in two different contexts. And uh, the kind of purpose of this talk today, I think is to just you know, get us thinking about uh, these kind of different settings uh, for, for simulation. And the one I'm most familiar with, I've pictured on the left and very simply, I'm sort of calling it Hamiltonian driven or Hamiltonian driven quantum simulation. And by simulation there, I really mean, you know, what we're, what we're maybe more, most familiar with as perhaps condensed matter theorists, uh, which is, you know, you know, using numerical methods, uh, using computational hardware to simulate either this, you know, equilibrium properties, the dynamical properties, maybe the low energy excitations or the topological, you know, invariance of some sort of quantum, let's call it matter or material. Uh, so, you know, just as a way of illustration, I pictured a single crystal of lithium homium fluoride, which some collaborators at our, uh, of ours at University of Waterloo study in experimental laboratories, and sort of the prototypical model, if you will, or the Hamiltonian, which we believe describes the behavior of lithium homium fluoride is a transverse field Ising model, right? So. Uh, my my job as a condensed matter theorist uh, performing quantum simulation may be to, uh, you know, uh, uncover the ground state properties, uh, you know, governed or the ground state governed by that Hamiltonian, uh, maybe the ec energy excitations, the spectrum, and, you know, perhaps the full dynamical properties if I'm lucky, right? And and the, the idea is that, we, you know, we want to do that on a computer because it's difficult to do analytically. The other setting which we'll hear for quantum simulation, particularly, the, particularly these days, is what I'm now calling a data-driven setting, uh, where I'm, I've prepared, or an experimentalist has prepared a highly controlled quantum device. And that device uh, you know, gives us access 
uh, to data. And I pictured some data here, which I'll talk extensively about on Rydberg Adam arrays. And that data can be used uh, to, you know, uh, you know, to reconstruct the behavior uh, of the experiment uh, or, you know, to, to basically, you know, in, in itself can have some sort of value. So that's, you know, when we talk about quantum simulation, uh, that is, you know, happening through experiments, quantum computers and other highly controlled devices, uh, like uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC devices, uh, that's the second setting. And so even though I work predominantly on the first setting, I only have really one slide to discuss the Hamiltonian driven setting. And, and it's because, uh, number one, uh, you know, I'm honored to share the stage with Frank Verstrade, who will talk a bit about uh, Hamiltonian driven simulation in the uh, using tensor networks. Uh, yeah, but number two, I really wanted to focus on sort of the machine learning aspect of quantum simulation. So the only thing I really wanted to draw our attention to on the Hamiltonian driven side or the conventional computational uh, you know, uh, simulation side uh, is the fact that we have a number of highly successful techniques for you know, yeah, in silico simulation of quantum many body systems. Uh, and these have been under development for decades. So uh, I mentioned te tensor networks and I you know, myself work quite extensively in quantum Monte Carlo and also variational methods like uh, variational Monte Carlo. Uh, all of these have, uh, are techniques which have strengths and weaknesses and are under development by a large community of, of condensed matter and quantum information theorists. Um, so the strengths and weaknesses of these different techniques are in many senses complementary. And, you know, we have a number of physical principles, I believe, uh, which tell us, you know, which simulation technique uh, will be most powerful for a given um, you know, I would say Hamiltonian to, for, for solving the properties of a given Hamiltonian. For example, in the case of tensor networks, which we'll hear about next, uh, you know, the, uh, you know the, the method is based on an onsots essentially uh, that, uh, you know, revolves around low entanglement or area law like entanglement, which is sub, you know, sub maximal in many senses. And what this does is uh, give us kind of a uh, I'd say a physical um, uh, bedrock or a physical cornerstone uh, for the development of tensor network methods. In quantum Monte Carlo, of course, we have the sign problem or the absence of a sign problem. Uh, so I will talk more about how sign problems affect both data-driven and Hamiltonian-driven simulation. Uh, you know, so how the sign structure uh, um, of a Hamiltonian or a wave function uh, affects these methods. And one thing which you uh, want to aspect, or I'd say one sort of physical or mathematical aspect, uh, which we I think we often overlook, which is very important for variational methods, is the concept of optimization, either of uh, you know parameters like variational parameters, or ergodicity in sampling, perhaps not parameters of a model, but configurations of say the ground state wave function or something like that. So these are three recurring themes which I'll actually come back to. Uh, when I talk about the data-driven setting. And so in this talk, I really want to ask the question, how do these experimental simulators or these emulators, which we've presumably constructed, you know, uh, to, um, you know, study systems which are difficult by conventional methods, how do they compete with or complement our existing numerical methods? So for example, uh, take given the case of, say, the Hubbard model or a frustrated spin model which has the sign problem uh you know which perhaps is on a two or three dimensional crystal lattice which is too um i'd say big for uh tensor network methods or dmrg in particular you know we may be motivated to build a quantum simulator uh which which you know which encapsulates that hamiltonian experimentally and so once we have that built or once a laboratory has that built what do we do with it how does it complement these techniques and how does it compete with these techniques? So to introduce the data-driven setting, I would um, I just want to give a kind of very simple sort of picture of uh, the interaction of a quantum device, you know, a highly controlled quantum simulator or a quantum computer and kind of a conventional computer uh, that we're using to, you know, to number one, design it. A lot of what we do, I believe, is, uh, you know, currently is helping design experiments control experiments. Okay. So control and the control of a quantum computer is sort of a very, I'd say rich uh, field of you know, physics and engineering, which has a lot of overlap with what, you, what we're talking about. And also of course the readout 
uh, you know, the state of the device. And, you know, the, I, I'm going to focus on uh, this latter um, task, which is reading out uh, data from this device. And I want uh, to kind of, you know, just for concreteness sake, to imagine that I have a quantum computer or a quantum simulator uh, that is producing projective measurements. So just very simple projective qubit measurements uh, uh, distributed according to the uh, Born rule. So that data set that I'm dealing with in this data-driven setting uh, is a number of vectors, you know, and each vector is a projective, you know, in the simplest case is a projective measurement of a qubit, which is either landing in, you know, the one or zero state, okay? And re by repeatedly preparing this device or preparing this, the wave function or the, the state of this device and performing a projective measurement, you know, each one of those measurements gives me one complete vector of data. And, you know, I might have some limited number D of these of this data. And at this point, I'm gonna start making analogies to tasks in machine learning. Uh, so really what each, uh, you know, for the machine learning efficient autos, I want you to think of each one of these data vectors as an image, could be an image of a cat or a dog or, you know, whatever it is. Each one of these zeros or ones is a pixel in that image. And my goal, uh, you know, given this data is to learn what we call a parameterized quote unquote model of the quantum state underlying that data. So in the machine learning context, you'd be interested in learning the distribution, for example, a probability distribution that underlies all pictures of cats or all pictures of dogs on the internet. Here, what we're doing is learning a model which, uh, you know, number one, uh, you know, parameterizes these, pro uh, these probability distributions, these born distributions, but, you know, I think more powerfully uh, uh, will parameterize the entire wave function. <clears throat> And I'm saying parameterized for a reason. I'm going to talk a lot about the parameters that are involved in uh, what we call these, these generative models. So in the data-driven setting, so again, I'm assuming most of us are familiar with, you know, you know, a model Hamiltonian that we want to solve for either the, you know, equilibrium or dynamical properties of. In the data-driven setting, we don't a priori have a Hamiltonian. And so we might ask, how do we train a model? You know, we might be more used to the variational setting uh, where we, you know, we calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian given a trial wave function. And we know that there's a variational bound, but we don't have access to the Hamiltonian. So what we do in the data driven setting when we want to train a model is to adjust the parameters or tune the parameters of the model to minimize the difference between the distribution that we're getting from our model. And I'll talk about what these are and the physical target distribution, which is these born distributed, you know, projective measurement distributions. And that can be done through uh, an object that's related to like the, you know, relative entropy of these two distributions, uh, the callback Leibler divergence. So P of X here in red might be the distribution that underlies the quantum simulator or the quantum computer that's been, you know, prepared in a certain state. And, you know, P lambda, uh, lambda uh, defines my, um, uh, parameters, weights and biases of a neural network or whatever, which I'll talk about. And so the callback leibler divergence basically returns zero when these two distributions completely overlap, right? And it's greater than zero if there's any sort of discrepancy like I've shown here. So that's it. That's all we need. We need to have a parameterized model, which gives us you know, the likelihood or gives us the probability uh, parameterized in these weights and biases, lambda. And we need access to data, which is these X vectors, um, uh, you know, from the previous slide. So, you know, with a little bit of manipulation, you'll see that this is equivalent to maximizing this, this problem of, of uh, minimizing the KL divergence is equivalent to maximizing something like a log likelihood. Where I've written this in terms of an expectation value uh, of log P lambda, which is a parameterized model distribution you know, taken with respect to data X drawn from P. So that's the data drawn from your quantum computer. And then all we have to do is in this maximization procedure is find, you know, the, you know, the extrema in this, in this landscape. So this defines our optimization problem. And we use something like stochastic gradient descent, you know, define the minimum or the maximum uh, in terms of these parameters, Lambda. And so this update step Lambda goes to Lambda prime uh, is often a simple kind of SGD uh, type of procedure borrowed from machine learning. Why do we do this? 
I mean, the first question you should be asking is, you know, why do we bother, you know, learning the parameters of a model if we have access to data that's drawn from the distribution? And the very simple explanation, just to nip this in a bud, uh, which is relevant for the experiments that I'm going to show, uh, is really, you know, the, the data that we have access to is limited, and it's in some cases severely limited by the experimental shot budget. So when I show you data for Rydberg atoms, uh, you know, we can only get data at the uh, frequency of something like three to maybe 10 shots per second. Um, and so these are very, you know, big, uh, elaborate experiments, and that's a significant kind of cost for data. So what generative models do is, you know, in a very simple sense, try to smooth out, uh, you know, any of the irregularities in the data caused, uh, you know, by this low, by any low sampling rate. And, and, and you know, that the goal is to generalize the data not seen in the training set. So what I mean is illustrated in these two plots here. So on the left is, you know, fairly complete sample of a distribution. Uh, I'll let, you know, leave the form of the distribution to your imagination. But you can see that with something like 10 to 100 uh, samples, I can't remember how many I produced here, you get a nice representation of, of sort of the distribution, you know, just from the frequency histogram, which is all that I've, I've plotted here. If, however, I was only able to sample a few hundred uh, uh, elements of, you know, a few hundred vectors, a few hundred elements of this uh, distribution, uh, I might get a much more choppy sort of uh, uh, histogram, which, which, you know, wouldn't it be great to, uh, in, in terms of inference or li uh, uh, calculating likelihoods and which we may want to generalize and the generalize, you know, generalization means drawing from a bin that essentially hasn't, hasn't been seen. So either something far out in the tails or something here where I have some sort of sparsity of data and what a generative model does is sort of the idea of the red uh, line. So that red line is actually, of course, a Gaussian that's fit with two parameters. And in that case, because we have some sort of, you know, bias, we have some sort of assumptions on the form of the distribution. These two parameters are enough to give us a real accurate uh, sort of uh, model of that data. But what I'm talking about are model in the next slides are, are going to be models with many, many more parameters. OK, uh, instead of just two. And the task is going to be to adjust all of these parameters, which could occur in some kind of neural network. Uh, sort of systematically to get a good interpolation or a good smoothing uh, of the distribution. And we see um, examples of this type of procedure all the time in machine learning. So I'm just showing elements of a, of a, a data set called Vox Celeb 2, uh, where a, a generative model, so one of these highly parameterized uh, models, uh, has been trained and then has been uh, you know, fed data uh, a limited data set in the, in the uh, form of these pictures. And of course there's pixels and this is some sort of, you know, single shot that's, that's came from an experiment, which is a camera. And, and on the left-hand side is the raw data set on the right-hand side are generated images. Okay. So these are generalized, you know, generated images uh, that don't occur in the data set because uh, you know, on one hand, you can imagine there's many pictures of, of Marilyn Monroe on, out there on the internet, but we, of course, don't have a complete sampling of all the possible states that she took, you know, uh, that her face basically took uh, over, over her lifetime. And what this generative model does is take a very limited data set, and because it's pre-trained on some other images, uh, basically, you know, generates these uh, images which have never been seen before. Okay, so that's kind of the underlying idea behind generative modeling is that, you know, given some limited data set, uh, we can produce uh, images or, or, you know, vectors X from a distribution, which, which aren't contained uh, in that set. So what I showed you are images produced by a generative model uh, that falls kind of uh, on one branch of this, I guess, taxonomy or this organizational structure for generative models, which I think is kind of relatively useful. So at the top of the tree here is maximum likelihood methods. And I talked about maximum likelihood being related to kobach leibler divergence. So in some sense, very much at the heart of data-driven um, you know, simulation. Uh, now I have two branches, one's implicit and one's explicit uh, density. And implicit density means essentially that your parameterization uh, you know, isn't explicitly representing uh, a probability distribution, or in our case, a quantum wave function. And GANs are famous uh, implicit density generative models. 
So the images that I just showed in the previous slide were generated by a GAN, okay? And without getting into a GAN very much, uh, you know, really you have some sort of training set, uh, which you've, which you have in this case uh, is, looks like it's MNIST, it's, it's these handwritten digits, but could be pictures of Albert Einstein or, you know, projective measurements from a quantum computer. Um, you have a generator structure, okay? And this generator structure is tuned to produce uh, a fake image or a generated image, you know, just given the input of some random noise. But importantly, sort of inside this generator, there's no explicit representation of the distribution that you're looking at. Um, really, all you're doing is using it to produce an image, which is then fed into another uh, neural network, a discriminator, which, which you know, triggers uh, the output of, you know, whether it's, it believes it's real or fake. Okay, and this is used to train, fed back into the generator and used to train it. So these are implicit density, uh, very powerful models, uh, but I guess my argument uh, against using implicit density models um, is, is I think for what you, you know, for the applications you'll see, uh, we don't have a lot of control on things like, you know, amplitude versus phase or purity of, of quantum states and so on. And, you know, for that sense, um, I'll show results exclusively for explicit density models. So explicit density models, I broken down into two different subcategories. One's approximate and one's tractable density. So explicit density means I have an explicit representation of the underlying probability distribution. And the most famous example for us physicists are these restricted Bolson machines. RBMs or earlier these uh, Hopfield networks uh, are essentially Ising models. And by the way, John Hopfield, uh, famous condensed matter uh, physicist. So, you know, the field was really started on the machine learning side, uh, you know, by some of the same, I would say, audience uh, as, as we're hoping to reach with this seminar series. So, you know, physicists have already contributed quite a bit to the, to, um, uh, the, the field of machine learning. So an RBM is just an Ising model, and I've just parameterized sort of a distribution, uh, you, you know, using an Ising Hamiltonian here uh, in, in, in kind of an unfamiliar form, uh, but W, I, J are just, you know, call them JIJs, if you will. They're just the interactions between two different nodes on this graph. And I've labeled the variables on these nodes uh, V and H for visible and hidden. And, you know, they, are they take Ising values zero or one. So this type of Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution is really just the, you know, the explicit density of this model. Um, two things to note. Number one, it's an approximate density model because we don't have access to the partition function. Okay, so it's unnormalized. Number two, it's systematically improvable. So these types of, you know, wave functions or distributions, if you will, have a representational capacity, which is going to be important for us. And we can systematically improve it by increasing the number of hidden units. So the number of visible units corresponds to how many qubits in your device. And the number of hidden units can be, uh, you know, can be uh, made larger or smaller, depending on how much you know, say entanglement or how much, uh, how many correlations you have to uh, represent. Although I'm not going to touch on it too much, the tractable density branch is probably the most exciting branch of this tree. And it includes uh, most of the natural language processing models, such as RNNs and the, you know, the, the more famous transformers like GPT-3. Uh, and, and basically anything that falls under the category of autoregressive models. Um, so, you know, very simply tractable density models give, a, you know, a normalized, if you will, probability distribution as an output. And I've shown an RNN here and, you know, inside, I should have put a Lambda, inside of each one of these orange boxes is a bunch of weights and biases and neural networks, which I'm not talking about. Uh, what you input into one of these units is the state of a qubit. So perhaps, you know, you have an N qubit system. Uh, this is the state of qubit three that comes from some measurement. H is a hidden unit or a hidden um, vector, which you pass along. And the output is the conditional distribution of the next qubit state along the chain conditioned on all the previous ones. And, you know, you keep repeating this for the how many qubits you have in your device. And this is, you know, through the chain rule of probabilities, this is what gives you this autoregressive property, this normalized property. So it's very important uh, and very powerful uh, in these tractable density models, uh, the fact that you have these normalized distributions, uh, which allows you to uh, produce perfect samples. Okay, and it's very similar to, 
I'd say DMRG in that sense, um, in the sampling algorithm by, I think it's Andy Ferris and Gifrey Vidal. Um, Frank will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you have a, a method of producing perfect samples uh, from DMRG, which is in some sense, very similar to these autoregressive models. So what I'm not gonna talk too much about is how we generalize these standard generative models for quantum wave functions, but you can, you can kind of get an idea um, from these schematic pictures that I've shown. So if I have a probability distribution, a classical distribution, uh, you know, I, it can be represented, you know, essentially by this, you know, um, restricted Boltzmann machine. And, you know, with some caveats, it's kind of a universal, uh, there's like a universality theorem associated with this, which says that any distribution within reason can be, um, you know, can be represented with enough resources. So enough hidden units or enough weights and biases. <clears throat> if I want to represent more than just, you know, a probability distribution, I want to have some sort of phase. There's a very simple way of doing this, either by uh, using complex weights, a la Carleo and Troyer, or, uh, you know, using another machine to just represent a parameterization of the phase. And that can be extended from pure states to mixed states uh, in some sort of purification scheme to give me a density matrix. So, you know, both, you know, complex uh, pure states and, you know, the density matrix representing mi mixed states uh, can easily be, con be constructed with standard generative models. And, you know, I've shown them with the RBM here, but really, uh, you know, I think essentially any generative model can be modified like this and can also use standard training techniques. And I won't talk about it, but there's also much more sophisticated ways of combining generative models, uh, you know, with things like POVMs or tensor network, uh, you know, representations of POVMs, uh, which have been uh, pioneered by Juan Carasquilla, which really allow for direct estimate of observables without, you know, an explicit reconstruction of the density matrix of the state like I've shown above. So I just wanted to mention this, um, although I won't, you know, really show too many results um, uh, from this. So what I want to do is back up and, you know, now that I hopefully have convinced you that we can use these methods to represent, you know, wide variety of quantum states, either, uh, you know, pure states or mixed states, I want to go back to the simplest case where I, am, I want to look at the pure state, which results uh, from, uh, you know, uh, you know, which is the ground state of a stochastic Hamiltonian. Okay. And this is important because it, it really kind of whittles down, um, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of the extra work involved in, in reconstruction of quantum states because it's so simple. So first off, what's a stochastic Hamiltonian by this, by my definition, which is, you know, I think standard and I believe uh, basis dependent, uh, you know, this Hamiltonian in, in a given computational basis, uh, if it has this type of form where uh, all of the off diagonal matrix elements are negative, uh, then we call that uh, a stochastic Hamiltonian. Okay. So this has a lot of uh, relationship to the sign problem. Of course, it essentially is the sign problem. So saying stochastic means that this Hamiltonian has no sign problem which also means that it can be simulated efficiently by quantum Monte Carlo methods. It is basis dependent. So you can have a basis, you know, you could have chosen a basis that's non-stochastic, uh, like in the case of, I don't know, you know, the Heisenberg model on the square lattice, two-dimensional square lattice, but there may be a very simple unitary transformation, which brings you into a stochastic basis. Uh, and so we, you, we, we, often is, we often say that you know, these problems, uh, these Hamiltonians that can be easily transformed to the stochastic form have no sign problem. For my, uh, for my purposes in this talk, uh, I'm going to use a slightly different uh, consequence, and that's through the parent Frobenius theorem, which basically says that if you have a Hamiltonian in this form, the extramal eigenvalues are all real and positive. So what it means is that if I have, if I believe that I'm preparing uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, state of a quantum device that's governed by a stochastic Hamiltonian, then I can assume that the data that I draw from that device, you know, um, it comes from a wave function where all coefficients are positive and real. And so the, the you know, the 
the wave function is then just really square root of the probability distribution. And that means if I want to model that wave function, I'm completely safe in just, you know, model, number one, uh, just modeling the amplitude. Okay. Like I did with a restricted Bolson machine uh, on the previous slide. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the big, the single basis, the computational basis in which I'm stochastic is informationally complete which means I don't need to, you know, draw samples from uh, an exponential number of bases. I can perform this reconstruction with one basis. So that, you know, fortunate state of affairs uh, is what occurs uh, in this Hamiltonian, which describes some real experiments that I'm going to um, um, discuss now. So this is a Rydberg blockade Hamiltonian. Uh, so, you know, so uh, basically been under consideration uh, in particular by Misha Lukin and others, uh, you know, for 20 years and uh, had a had an interesting, uh, you know, theoretical set of developments by Paul Fenley and collaborators uh, back in 2004, which showed that this Hamiltonian is a very interesting uh, uh, many body interacting Hamiltonian that can realize uh, uh, a, a large number of interesting phases due to this so-called blockade mechanism. So what is the blockade Hamiltonian? <clears throat> So I've written it in terms of uh, the Rydberg occupation basis. Okay, so a Rydberg atom is just an atom that uh, you know uh, approximates a two-level system, uh, and atoms you know can occur. You know each atom's electron can occur in its uh, the ground state or a highly excited state. So these are something like rubidium atoms. Uh, the ground, uh, sorry, the Rydberg state is something like principal quantum hundred quantum number like a hundred-ish. And, uh, you know, the, the atom takes these two states uh, and a transition is induced by sort of a Rabi frequency, which I've called Omega here, or Rabi drive. Uh, and so, you know, you, this, is, this is the zeros and ones of your data sets, or this is the, uh, you know, the two states of the qubit, if you will. Um, the sigma X operator, so I've written in this poly uh, kind of notation, uh, is the off diagonal operator that's associated with that um, Rabi frequency. Delta is the detuning. So what you what delta does is detune, uh, you know the you know off of uh, sort of resonance, if you will. So it breaks the symmetry between uh, ground state and Rydberg state. And most importantly, Vij is an interaction which occurs between all you know i and j atoms in this Rydberg array. So it's a long range interaction which has this van der Waal form. Uh, and importantly, so it's the case is one over R6, and it can be written in terms of uh, a parameter which we call the river blockade, which is essentially an effective radius outside of which, uh, you know, you need another atom needs to be in order to not, you know, be interfered with. So, that, you know, there's a cost of energy here if two atoms are both in their highly excited Rydberg state, unless they're outside of this Rydberg blockade radius this blockade radius so that's one way of thinking about it and so what that means is that you know you have a long range interaction the lattice geometry is very crucial and you'll get all sorts of different phases and phase transitions uh you know depending on you know the river blockade the lattice and all of these other parameters so very interesting hamiltonian uh, can be prepared in experiment which i'm going to show and it's also stochastic under a, a very simple local basis transformation which flips the sign here so that's important here is some of the most recent theoretical and experimental work uh, out of Harvard and MIT, which studies Rydberg uh, blockage, which I think is, is really fascinating. So here's a theoretical um, uh, you know, phase diagram, um, which has been uh, you know, mapped out with DMRG. Uh, and one thing I want to point out is that you know, this is, ex this is uh, on a square lattice Rydberg system. Uh, of the same size as what can be reached experimentally. Uh, and this second paper here is basically a nature paper on a roughly 16 by 16 array size um, through, uh, from Misha Lukin's group at Harvard. So, you know, what's, in what's exciting about these experiments is they're now accessing, you know, things which we dreamed about theoretically for decades, such as quantum critical points, in this case between Disordered is all, you know, ground state. Checkerboard is some sort of pi pi order. And, you know, here, without saying too much about it, is the experimental results for the 
you know, Rydberg occupation susceptibility, which is taking the numerical derivative of the occupation value as you sweep across uh, this phase transition. Uh, that numerical derivative is fit, uh, and then you know, the maximum is used to, de de uh, to define the position of the critical uh, detuning. And through some collapse, which I won't talk about, critical exponents are extracted. So this is all experimental. So Sabir Satchev says this is the uh, you know, first instance of a two plus one dimensional quantum critical point in the Ising universality class that has ever been demonstrated experimentally. So, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting to get access to these types of uh, experiment and the data they produce. Another interesting set of experiments, which is motivated, you know, by these theoretical papers uh, and including, again, the DMRG uh, mapped out phase diagram is the existence of spin liquids. And I'll get back to it, but, you know, there's two separate papers, one by Satchdevs uh, and collaborators, one by Vishenoff and collaborators, um, which show evidence for uh, you know, in certain parts of these phase diagrams for different lattices, uh, you know, Z2 type spin liquids uh, using DMRG simulations on sort of fat cylinders. Okay. And there's, there's also uh, experiment that has recently come out on 219 atoms that has studied this spin liquid. So quantum critical points, you know, topological phases, you know, this is why we want to build quantum emulators or data-driven quantum simulators experimentally. Because in principle, we should be able to access all this sort of interesting condensed matter phenomenon, uh, you know, in these highly controlled uh, devices. And so how do we leverage these devices? I just want to show an example of how uh, we can imagine using this data uh, in a very simple one dimensional array. So forget kind of the 2D phase, you know, 2D square and frustrated lattices I was showing in the previous slide. Very simply, here's a here's some experiments from uh, uh, this paper um, uh, by Misha Lukin uh, and, you know, using some of the work by Manuel Andres uh, for, you know, the optical tweezer setup uh, for these 1D arrays. And each one of these is like my data vector X. So just keep that in mind. And, you know, if I have a, a black dot here, maybe that's a one or a zero. And if everything's in the black dot phase, this is everything's in its ground state. And then as a function of, you know, actually what happens in the experiments is an adiabatic uh, uh, sweep of the detuning. What happens in these experiments is you can sweep along different uh, lines in these phase diagrams, depending on your sort of Rydberg blockade, right? That RB parameter, uh, which is tuned by the lattice spacing very simply using the optical twe tweezers. And so I can uh, use this adiabatic sweeping of the detuning to sort of start in everything in the ground state, uh, prepare that. And I can sweep into things like Z2, Z3, Z4 uh, types of ordered lobes um, uh, in, in these experiments. And there's a lot of interesting experimental and theoretical work, even in these 1D cases, uh, which has come out recently. So what we did uh, in collaboration with um, Emmanuel Andres and Misha Lukin, and this was a work spearheaded by Giacomo Torla, who's now at Amazon, and Brian Timar and others, is we basically use the Rydberg array data as a training set for a generative model. And again, here's this adiabatic sweeping as a function of time. You see that your omega and your delta parameters uh, in the experiment uh, you know, are, are sort of modified uh, in order to sweep through different, as, uh, different cuts on the phase diagram. So we expect a, a, a phase transition to occur at some point here. What the experimentalists could provide is 3,000 projective measurements per detuning parameter. So remember that these, these um, it depends on the, the dimensionality of the, the array, uh, but this data can be obtained maybe, you know, at, that, at a rate of three vectors per second, or maybe up 10 on these, these 1D experiments, I can't quite remember. So they're, they're relatively expensive uh, to kind of resolve phase diagrams, but that's great for generative modeling. So we assume that the Rydberg Hamiltonian, which governs these experiments is stochastic. So it means we're assuming purity and positivity of the wave function, okay? And then uh, essentially what we're doing is training a generative model and producing estimators. So I'll show how that looks on the next slides. Okay, so let me, let me just decipher this. So EXP is the experiment. So the black line uh, connects, uh, th this is essentially, uh, Rydberg occupation data, and I've just rewritten it as sigma z for some reason, but it, it's it's like occupation of the ground state. 
So you know, you know, a hundred percent chance of essentially being in the the entire array is in the ground state like this uh, for low values or large negative values of of detuning, uh, and each one of these black you know lines connects a data point. So um, the ED is an exact diagonalization of of that Hamiltonian. So it's kind of like the Hamiltonian driven simulation of of the ex, of the experimental Hamiltonian. And it looks like you have great uh, correspondence between uh, the ED, and again, this is only eight or nine uh, atoms in this chain, so we can do diagonalization. The experiment, and the RBM is the reconstruction from the experimental data, which we did. So again, we assume purity, purity and positivity of the wave function. Uh, we use a restricted Boltzmann machine, very simple, with a certain number of hidden units. Uh, we, you know, we, um, uh, you know, basically say that the wave function of the model is square root of the probability distribution. We train it with conventional methods, stochastic gradient descent, KL divergences, and then any diagonal observable. So any anything that's any operator that's diagonal in the Rydberg occupation basis is it's you know very simple uh, to take the trained model and to reconstruct the estimator from it. Okay, and so that's exactly what we've done here. And these RBM triangles show that you know you get perfect agreement between uh, the reconstructed, uh, you know, wave function and the experiment. And so maybe no big surprise, right? So I think what's a bit more interesting is the fact that you know since you know all of these assumptions that of of positivity and purity, uh, and you know the fact that there's no you know the fact that there's no phase associated with this wave function. Uh, allow us to do all sorts of tricks, which we've adopted essentially from variational Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so for example, if I have an off diagonal operator, Sigma X, um, uh, yeah, and I want to, you know, understand the expectation value of that operator, you know, typically this isn't something that uh, you have direct access to, uh, you know, from, from the experiment, because you only have uh, data that looks like this, which is diagonal in the occupation basis. <laughs> So what we've shown here is an exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian driven simulation. And then the RBM is a data driven reconstruction of the, of the ground state uh, wave function. And what we've done is, is uh, calculated the off diagonal, um, the, the expectation value of the off diagonal operator uh, using this trick of rearranging things uh, to produce the local estimator. So this local estimator is again some notation used in variational Monte Carlo. So when you have a explicit representation, so an explicit density representation uh, of the of the of the wave function here, as long as this local estimator is sparse enough, uh, this is something you can, can can easily calculate. So what you see is uh, you know we have a discrepancy between the Hamiltonian driven expectation and the uh, data driven reconstruction of this estimator. And I think what's kind of interesting about uh, this case is, is exactly this discrepancy. You know, this is something we get to feedback into the, uh, you know, experimental design. And, and, you know, and it illustrates that even though you can have, you know, some estimators behaving uh, very well, uh, it's worth it to look at some of these other estimators, especially these off the angle ones, which can indicate experimental issues. So in this case, I think this was corrected by the final uh, version of this paper. Um, and there was some detuning offset essentially here, okay. And you know <clears throat> something to do with control software timing, which again I don't really know anything about. Uh, but this was, you know, I think a valuable illustration of how uh, this type of reconstruction can be used to help uh, influence uh, uh, and understand experiments. And then you know you get into interesting questions about you know whether or not you trust the model, right? Whether you're sort of like data-driven learning procedure. Uh, is 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 you know getting stuck or whether it's training uh, properly and so on. But I'll address those maybe a bit more at the end. Just another nice example of what this type of uh, method can do uh, is illustrated here uh, in the second Rennie entropy. So again, this is a you know this is an experiment where you only have access to uh, you know these fluorescent images of the atoms, um, you know either the, in the ground state or the Rydberg state. Uh, you know, the second, uh, you know, the entanglement entropies aren't something that we typically uh, imagine getting from uh, data like this. But, you know, what can be done very simply 
uh, once we have one of these generative models is uh, sort of the swap operator trick, uh, which I've written out in Penrose notation here, but <clears throat> you can read about in, in, in one of our papers, uh, which gives us access to the second Rini entropy, which is a measure of the entanglement entropy that's completely basis independent. Uh, so here's a second Rini entropy as a function of detuning for different bipartitions of a eight atom system. And again, you can see discrepancies between uh, the, the, the experimental reconstruction, which is the diamonds and the triangles, and, you know, the expectation from Hamiltonian driven simulation. So again, this is something that... Uh, yep. We're at, we're at uh, almost 10 till, if we could wrap it up, but just a few minutes to leave time for questions. That would Perfect. Be yeah. Oh, I think this is my last, my last point. Yep. Perfect. So, so this, uh, so all I wanted to say was entanglement entropy, uh, you know, it's also something that we can reconstruct uh, essentially directly from this experimental data. And it kind of leaves us at this interesting point with these simulators, which I've illustrated here, which, you know, if you read a lot of these Rydberg atom papers, of course, the phase diagram has been mapped out with uh, DMRG on fat cylinders. Um, this suggests parameters in the experiment. So I'm looking at some of these spin liquid experiments. Here's a Kegame lattice. Um, and, you know, once we, once we, or the experimentalists sort of stabilize, uh, you know, a region on the phase diagram that they find interesting, you know, they want to confirm whether or not a spin liquid exists there, for example. Uh, and so there's all sorts of measurements that can be taken experimentally in this occupation basis. What I'm sort of suggesting here is that, you know, all the experimentalists really have to do is produce clean projective measurements of the qubit states. And then this hasn't been done yet, really. Um, except for that previous illustration. But then we can use this projective measurements, these projective measurements to reconstruct a wave function or a density matrix or whatever you want. Uh, and then, you know, from that, you know, which is essentially as good as a variational wave function that's been trained, uh, you know, with knowledge of the Hamiltonian. This is a, this is a you know, a onsatz wave function trained with data. We can do any measurements that are accessible to, um, uh, you know, these methods that I mentioned. So in particular, things like the topological entanglement entropy and so on. So I think it's kind of interesting to see the interplay or to imagine the interplay between conventional Hamiltonian driven simulation, experiment and reconstruction uh, in these, and specifically in these uh, Rydberg spin liquids. Uh, but, you know, I think also in, in other um, uh, sort of quantum, experimental quantum simulators. So with that, let me just skip to um, my discussion points. So the point I wanted to get across, standard generative models can be easily, you know, borrowed from machine learning, either in, in, you know, image, you know, computer vision, let's call it, or natural language processing can easily be adapted to reconstruct quantum states from data. Uh, and then what I didn't really talk too much about is, is reconstructing states that uh, come from Hamiltonians that aren't stochastic or from dynamical pro uh, processes, but this is also something that can be very easily done. <laughs> There's a new generation of variational wave function motivated by these models. Okay, I talked about the data-driven setting, um, and I alluded to the fact that these wave functions have uh, can be systematically improved by increasing the number of weights and biases. So when, when Frank gives us talk, if you talk, if we talk about the bond dimension, which you can systematically increase in order to improve the representational capacity, these variational wave functions can also be systematically improved with more weights and biases. Uh, you may remember uh, Giuseppe Carleo and Matthias Troyer's paper in 2017, which introduced this concept of variational simulations with neural networks. Today, I think there's many really exciting architectures related to autoregressive models, recurrent neural networks, and transformers. Um, and I've illustrated a two-dimensional RNN here, which is under development by uh, Moh Mohamed Hibet Allah and Juan Karaskia at Vector Institute, which I think is a very promising variational wave function. And again, the nice thing about these variational or these neural network onsets is that they can be used for Hamiltonian and data-driven simulation. So we're really just entering the, the, the phase, uh, you know, where, you know, experiments with clean projective measurements, again, uh, you know, can produce data that can be used to, to train one of these onsets wave functions. And in the case where you have very limited data, 
we can imagine doing additional training steps with a variational method. So you can imagine some sort of hybrid training of these uh, wave functions where, you know, it's partially driven by experimental data, you know, partially driven by something like a variational uh, update. And I think this kind of hybrid method, you know, number one, I think it's very interesting to pursue in the future. Um, number two, I think it raises a lot of questions of, you know, what, you know, what we mean when we talk about reconstructing experiments and sort of how much maybe modeling we're comfortable with uh, when we when we talk about these experimental wave functions. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And I can take some questions. Great. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hands or put them in the chat. Um, I have a very short question. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, Roger, you were talking about experimental wave functions. When you go to like many Rydberg atoms, uh, it may be difficult to reach ground states or states close to ground states. So can your analysis tell that you are far from ground states, for example? Okay, so could my analysis tell me whether the experiment has achieved uh, its goal of, of preparing a ground state or not. That's right, yeah. I'd say that's a very kind of condensed matter. I think the answer to that question is a very condensed matter question in some sense. Um, so number one, you would, I, I believe it would, you know, it would help to look at uh, discrepancies from what we, from expected ground state behavior. And, you know, we certainly could imagine um, reconstructing, you know, other excited states uh, if we're given that data. Uh, so I think number one, the answer is be answer is like you know you're comparing perhaps uh, you know different models for the behavior, um, which I think in the era of quantum supremacy or quantum advantage, when these computers get bigger than what we can simulate. Uh, I think then it'll be an issue because we're going to ask, you know, what, what do we compare to another, um, another point is that you may be able to uh, essentially reconstruct wave functions or, or, or density matrices that have additional parameters that include either like a purification or something like the phase, and then look at the values of those weights. So try to interpret uh, you know, the neural network to see if there's elements leaking in that aren't part of the ground state. But, you know, that I think that there's a lot of unknowns there because basically what you're asking for is an interpretable method. And any of us that work on machine learning know that interpreting what's going on in the architectures is always, uh, always a challenge. So I don't have a great answer. Sorry, Baskaran. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dean, go ahead. So, so Roger, that was a great talk. Uh, thanks so much. I learned a lot from that. Um, my question is, if you have a situation where the, you know that the Monte Carlo simulation has a severe sign problem because of, of intrinsic frustration, there's no pairing channels, for example, in a fermionic system, then do you expect the same problem to occur in a restricted Boston machine that you would have difficulty reproducing uh, the, the phenomena? Yeah, it's a super great question. Um... First off, if, if I go back to this slide, I could ask that same question about a variational Monte Carlo simulation, which has no sign problem really, and like a you know a quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So, you know, if I have a sign structure which gives me maybe a exponentially exploding uh, variance on an estimator, like in a Hubbard model, um, okay, so that's you know the the source of that's sort of obvious. But if I, if I have a variational method, which I'm trying to optimize parameters of, and, and you know, the, the, the question is, you know, is that, will that work? And if it doesn't work, if I don't get a good ground, say why? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of discussion about, you know, the roughness of this landscape that you're optimizing in that sense. And, you know, whether or not, say, if you have frustration that, that, that turns, uh, that gives you a glassy landscape, or, or, you know, if you have a sign problem where that gives you glassiness in the landscape, so those same questions apply here. So if I have a restricted Bolson machine, I'm really kind of on the right-hand side and I'm optimizing it, you know, not variationally, but with data, but I could certainly have a challenge in that optimization step if that landscape isn't well-behaved. 
And, and for me, it's very hard to know how that connects to things like a sign problem. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dean. Sure. Great. I think we have time for one more quick question. Uh, Manu, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. I have a very simple question. So in this one, uh, can you just calculate the density matrix or you can also calculate some of the coefficient of the wave function? So I think what you asked is whether I can calculate a density matrix. So yeah, here are two examples of where uh, we've parameterized density matrices. Uh, so here's an explicit parameterization of a density matrix using these techniques I've talked about. So yes, you can, you can certainly, um, you know, calculate, if you will, uh, or represent the, uh, a pure state wave function. Uh, but, you know, a mixed state is also possible. And uh, you have a choice between an explicit parameterization, which gives you access, uh, you know, to all the coefficients, if you will, if you want to think about it like that. But we also have, um, you know, machine learning motivated, I would say, models of density matrices, which aren't explicit. So in that case, you know, if, if I think of a non-explicit representation of a wave function, you may not have direct access to the amplitudes. Um, but you can still do things like maybe calculate some limited amount of estimators or so on. So the analogy I think is the same for the density matrix. You can have a very powerful implicit representation, uh, which might not give you, you know, directly the form of the density matrix, but can give you any sort of estimator that you want to calculate from it within reason. So I think that's my answer. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.